Lord, open our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we might find the courage to hear and to trust and to follow in your way. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58. The people of Israel are in exile, and they are frustrated. They are frustrated with God. They are fasting and doing all the right rituals, but they feel like God is just ignoring them. They ask, why do we fast, but you do not see us? Why do we humble ourselves, but you do not notice? But God, speaking through the prophet, is also frustrated with the people. In these verses, God confronts the people of Israel about the hypocrisy of their worship. Speaking through the prophet, the Lord says this, Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day, and you oppress all of your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. But is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then, then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. Then you will cry for help, and the Lord will say, Here I am. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the book of James, chapter 2. Let us listen again to God's word. What good is it if people say that they have faith, but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine someone who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Now someone might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. As the lifeless body is dead, so faith without works is dead. This is the word of the Lord. This morning I've asked members of our mission team that travel to Washington, D.C. to come forward and share some of their experience with us. Not all of them were able to be here today, but I'm grateful for all of those and especially grateful for the many of you who said yes to my invitation. Honestly, they were more voluntold than volunteered. Um, now, before they share, I want to say a couple of things about why I believe it's not only appropriate for them to be speaking here today, but why I think it's really important that they be here today in worship. Yes, it is appropriate for them to share. They will be sharing things that will be informative. You will hopefully learn more about their experience and gain insight into the mission immersion that took place at, the, at a place called the Pilgrimage. Much like our own Asheville, Asheville Youth Mission, the Pilgrimage equips groups of youth and adults to put their faith in action in a variety of ways. And yes, this faithful action has impacted members of our group in profound ways. But why I believe it is important to have this experience shared in worship is because 
what this group experienced in DC is not simply something that they did on their own, but rather it is something that they did as an extension of this congregation. When mission teams go out to places and put their faith in action, they go out as representatives of the body of Christ. They go out as your representatives, the congregation that has nurtured and equipped them to do this mission. Our theology of mission tells us that what this group of 11 did in DC was done on your behalf. The mission was an extension of the boundary-breaking love of Christ that we all seek to share as disciples here at First Presbyterian Church of Asheville. Your love and prayers, your gifts and support, all of this enabled this experience to happen. And so sharing this experience with you is important because it is an extension of the ministry of this church. One of our oldest and most faithful members of the church, 99-year-old Norma Forbes, reminded me of this truth when I visited her several years ago. Holding the church newsletter in her hand, Norma told me how much it meant to her to belong to a church that engaged in mission so deeply. I believe that those faithful ones like Norma who support mission activities through their prayers and their interests and their gifts are just as present in mission as those of us who actually go out and do the work. But there's another important reason, I believe, why mission um, should be shared in the context of worship. And it's because of the intrinsic relationship between mission and worship. Though we tend to think of mission as something that's done out there in the world and worship is something that we do here in the sanctuary or the chapel, that really is a false divide. When we are out in the world doing the acts of love and justice that James upholds as non-negotiables in his epistle reading, we are not only practicing our faith in real ways, we are actually worshiping the God who has made us, the God who claims us in the waters of baptism, the God who feeds us at the table, the God who equips us to go out to share the good news that we belong to a God of justice, that we belong to a God of love. What the prophet Isaiah reminds us is that how we live out our faith matters to God each day. When we loose the bonds of injustice, when we advocate to let the oppressed go free, when we share our bread with the hungry and those who are homeless, we are not simply doing good works. We are worshiping the God who has made us all. When faithful action takes place in our lives, then we will begin to reflect the light and love of Christ. Our light will break forth like the dawn. God's healing shall spring up quickly, and we will be fully alive as Christ's disciples. And it is here in worship each week that we are equipped to do and to be God's mission in the world. So as we listen this morning to the reports and testimonies of these young folks and adults who went to D.C., I pray that we will all be reminded that this mission experience really is our mission and that this mission is an invitation to grow in faith, in good works, and in worship. Snaps for Mr. Michael. Okay. On our first full day in DC, we went to Sunday morning worship at the Church of the Pilgrims, the church we stayed at during the week. We were staying in the basement, which was kind of like a dormitory, in that it had a washer and dryer, bunk beds for everybody to sleep in, and bathrooms with showers. Earlier that morning, as a, Sunday, as a sort of Sunday school, we met with a woman named Deborah. Deborah explained that while we were there, we would be seeing DC beyond the monuments, or the poorer part of DC. Some of our time would be spent in the southeastern quadrant, or the poorest part of DC. A local representation of that would be if you went to the Tupelo Honey across from Pritchard Park. You guys know where that is, right? 
So um, the Tupelo honey represents the wealthier part or the northwestern part of DC. Then if you look across the street, in DC the street would represent a river, you can see Pritchard Park, which would be the poorer or southeastern part of DC. We may see that poorer sector, but choose not to acknowledge it. And apparently, this is what most of our elected officials do. We were told that if you call an ambulance in the southeastern part of DC, by the time the ambulance got there, the person in trouble would most likely be dead. Whereas in the northwestern and richest part of DC, they have the quickest response time of any of the quadrants. You call the ambulance, and within 10 or 15 minutes, it arrives. Even some of the locals were surprised that we crossed the river, saying things like, really, the volunteers don't cross the river. But this is where project transformation took place, in a church across the river. Monday morning, we got up, had breakfast, loaded up the bus and headed to the southeast side of DC across the Anacosta River, the other DC. Several people commented through the week that volunteers don't cross the river. We pulled up at a church called Brighter Day Ministries, tucked in a housing complex that was obviously in a low income area. This morning we were working with Project Transformation Project Transformation provides day camps for children with a focus on literacy. It is an organization that is paired with churches to build relationships and make connections with their communities. The day camp is staffed by college students and volunteers like us. The day camp, we spent two mornings, Monday and Wednesday, with Project Transformation. Wednesday, Brooke, our seminary intern guide from the pilgrimage, was able to join us. Our morning looked like this. We arrived about 9 a.m. The children trickled in and were greeted with song and dance. The college staff led us in dance moves to songs like Take Us to Rio, our favorite. Look it up if you don't know it. This, is, this allowed the children to be familiar with us. After a short dance session, the children had breakfast and split into three groups. One group was movement, one group did art, and one group did reading. Each child was paired with a volunteer. On Monday, I was paired with a four-year-old girl who was learning sight words, and we also played a word matching game. She really seemed to enjoy that. On Wednesday, I was paired with Tyler, an 11-year-old boy. He was told not to fall asleep again today while reading. Tyler was a very good reader. He sounded out words very well and liked learning new words that he read. I must say, he did yawn a lot. I said, Tyler, why are you yawning so much? You're making me yawn. He said, I don't even know. I'm not tired. We laughed and he was eager to read more. He was making connections in the story as he read The Curse of the Boggin. And he was very excited to catch me up on the story that I had missed from days before. When we got to the seven minute time to wrap up, Tyler said, oh, I wanna read some more. That was exciting to me that Tyler really enjoyed the book that he was reading and he seemed very happy that I was interested in what was happening in the book as well. I won't soon forget Tyler. After the reading session was done, the children headed to lunch and we were off to our next adventure. Hi, I'm Margaret. So two weeks ago, we went to Washington DC on our mission trip and I had the best time. Um, on Tuesday, which was the third day we were there, we went to Seabury Age In Place, an agency that helps low-income senior citizens with housing. At Seabury, we cleaned the inside of the building. We cleaned the residents' rooms by dusting, mopping, and cleaning the windows. We also cleaned common areas like the di dining room, TV room, and steps. After cleaning, they announced that there would be bingo with some of the residents from the building. Only one lady showed up. Her name was Annie Bryce. 
She was the bingo queen. After we played bingo, we went outside to a really nice porch and had our bagged lunches. Miss Bryce came out to the porch to visit with us and told us her story. Miss Bryce told us that she lived by the Bible verse, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And this verse had served her well throughout life. I saw God in this experience because he brought us to Miss Bryce and we played bingo with her and heard her story. On Wednesday, we went to a nonprofit organization called A Wider Circle. A Wider Circle takes old furniture and business clothes from donations and gives it out to people who need it for free. The people who tend to ask for furniture are people in poverty or people who just, need, who just got out of homelessness and need to furnish their houses. They get, to, they get their donations from people who drive up, who just drive up with a trunk full of stuff, or they get their, or a few trucks that they have driving around picking up things from people's houses. A wider circle does not put everything that they get from donations in the showroom that people can choose furniture from. Instead, they check all of their donations to see if there are any tears, stains, or defects. They call this the dignity test. If the, if the piece doesn't pass the test, then they will put it out, and they will not put it out. However, they still take all the donations and put them in the basement of their building to go to the junkyard or to be donated to other nonprofits. Once a piece goes to their showroom, anyone can come and get it. Once someone claims a piece, all they have to do is drive it to their house. They don't have to load it into a truck if they brought one over. They just have to get it to their house and unload it. While we were there, they gave us all different jobs. Some people were filtering through the donations to see if they could display them. Some people were sorting clothes, and other people were sorting out children's toys. And some people were loading and unloading the trucks full of furniture. I was one of the people loading the trucks, and after I'd finished moving this woman's furniture, she came up to me and she was so thankful and excited to get, she was getting new furniture in her house. I could see that we had made a big difference in just the few hours that we were there. Miss Hardy was her name. She clasped her purse and walked through the showroom, stopping to put a sticker with her name on it, on a chair, asking if it was all right if she chose this cabinet or that table. She picked out her furniture and spoke aloud about her plans for the piece. Now this picture will go above my bathtub. Look, that lady in that picture looks like me and I'm gonna lie back and relax in my tub just like that. I had to get this extra long couch because my youngest is 6'6", six, six. and that dresser is just like my mama's. A fire took her home, her belongings, and her heirlooms. Kindness and accepting peacefulness and willingness to listen and be present were used to break her yoke of oppression. She didn't want to leave after she picked up her household items or after Michael, Mo, Calvin, a few other volunteers and I had moved them. In fact, she brazenly asked Mo and me, what's your prayer request? She firmly grasped our hands in a way that made it adamantly clear we were not getting them back until she was good and ready to release them. And then she prayed for us. She was a wonderfully strange mixture of prophet, manic crazy woman, broken one, and healing healer. The volunteer coordinator at a wider circle told our group that their program is not about giving people furniture and stuff for their homes. It's about giving a family a chance to sit together on a couch and watch a movie and laugh until their stomachs hurt. It's about siblings having a bed to lie in as they stay up late giggling. It's about a family of eight with only three spoons, taking turns eating, one washing his spoon when finished so he can give a clean one 
to the next person. It's about that family coming in and being so excited to get enough spoons so that they could all sit together at, at the same table and eat as a family. That is where I saw God. On Thursday, we did something a little different. We went to the PCUSA Office of Public Witness, which is a public policy information and advocacy office for the General Assembly of the Church. The office's task is to advocate the social witness perspectives and policies of the Presbyterian General Assembly. It was located right next to the Supreme Court, which the staff told us was very convenient for protesting, which they did a lot of. They shared with us a quote by a really old Presbyterian named John Calvin, which says, Civil magistracy is calling not only holy and legitimate, but by far the most sacred and honorable in human life. This quote sums up what the Office of Public Witness is all about, which is taking God's grace to the ugly world of politics. I thought it was interesting how it's taught that we are supposed to strive for a separation of church and state, and yet this agency seems to be doing just the opposite. This topic came up within our youth group this year at the Montreat Youth Conference, where we had discussions about how God calls us to stand up for one another, even if it means getting political. Because shying away from injustice of any kind is wrong, especially political injustice, which we all know can do the most harm of any. When we got there in the morning, we were greeted by two college-age women who were interns for the summer. It was actually their last day on the job. They talked to us with the slideshow presentation about what the office did and how they were seeking justice in the world. They then transitioned into teaching us about a current piece of legislation called the Farm Bill, which we would be discussing with assistance of our two NC senators. The cool thing was that the bill was still currently under debate in Congress and versions of it were being drafted by both the House and the Senate to be voted on. The bill is pretty complicated, and I couldn't understand it all because there were so many components. But the important factor is with a program called SNAP, which is a food stamp program available to people in need. They explained to us how if the Senate version of the bill didn't pass, there would be some significant reductions in SNAP, as well as harsher requirements to qualify for SNAP in the future. I think we're all pretty nervous for the meeting, and we didn't quite know what to expect. After a couple practice sessions and some waiting, the time finally came for us to have our first meeting with two young women, Corey and Tori, who work for Senator Tom Tillis. Thankfully, the meeting had, been, had a more relaxed atmosphere than I thought, and we all got a chance to go around and share some of the things we experienced during the week that hopefully would be shared with the senator as proof that the stamp the food stamp program needed to stay in place. Some of the comments we shared were things we heard when we handed out bag lunches, like Olivia Bell heard someone say, I didn't know if I was going to eat today, or how we saw a six-year-old bringing candy and soda for breakfast at the Project Transformation summer camp. Although there were some awkward moments, and we all felt, we all felt that the meetings went well and we got our point across, all three senator assistants reassured us that groups like ours do have an impact on decisions in Congress and that our voices were heard. It was a good feeling to know that the meetings were all over with and that we didn't screw anything up. Overall, I can speak for the whole group in saying that we all learned a whole lot that day about ourselves, the Farm Bill, and a new way to do justice in this world and spread God's love. One night, a man named David Harris visited our group at the pilgrimage. His story is about growing up middle class and becoming homeless. David never thought he would end up as one of those people. David had many hardships growing up. He was molested, he had a child at 16, and he got sick, which resulted in massive hospital bills. David eventually wound up being homeless for five years. During this time, he visited Charlie's Place, which changed his life. He was introduced to poetry, and he found his passion and talents for poetry. 
David now speaks to groups like ours in DC and has published a book of poetry. This is the book. David not only shared his story with us, but facilitated great conversation with our group about the week and our takeaways. My most powerful moment of the trip was when a woman named Miss Hardy from Wider Circle, who was getting free furniture, went out of her way to pray for me. <clears throat> Charlie's Place is a type of soup kitchen run out of the fellowship hall of a church. Sounds kind of familiar, right? This one is at St. Mark Ridge's Episcopal Church in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of DC. For about three hours every Tuesday through Saturday mornings, folks come in, sit, drink coffee and hot tea, eat a warm meal, have a safe spot, companionship. They can even get a haircut. They check in with Charlie's Place director, who's also a social worker. They can get vitamins and Advil if needed. In fact, in the line to get coffee, there are little medicine cups full of vitamins and Advil. Pick it up if you need it. We arrived at 6 a.m. Friday morning. Sit with that for a minute. We're teenagers and it's summertime. We have to get up, eat, walk somewhere, and be sociable by 6 a.m. on a Friday morning. That was big. We went to learn about the program, help serve, and mostly be present. Mina, a 20-something year old DC native, waved her hand graciously and allowed me to sit with her. She used to make a two-hour commute one way to work. Now she doesn't sleep at all when it rains, and it rained a whole lot while we were there. She says she stands under awning. Sometimes she will find a broken umbrella in a trash can that can Sometimes somebody will give you an umbrella. She was quiet. She looked down while she was talking. She looked at her coffee. Occasionally, she can get a little animated. But before she left, she looked at me and said, pray for me. Richard, originally from New York, a university professor. He'd been teaching overseas when he, would called, when he was called home because his parents were both failing in health. Eventually, the family old, and he gradually weighed, made his way to living on the streets. When he found out I'm in, in education, we compared notes. He spoke of federal education studies he, I'd heard of, some of which he'd helped, helped complete. We discussed literature, which was his. We compared books we'd read. Now he sleeps outside a grocery store and a lawyer's office. He says that the store and the lawyer allow him though, as long as he's only there between 11 p.m. and 11 a.m. When we parted, he looked directly into my eye and said, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And I thought, oh my God, it was a pleasure to talk to you. There was a difference in Mina and Richard's history, in their education and in their conversation. But what I learned that they, could be any of us. They could be me. They could be you. It all depends on life circumstances. A bumper sticker comes to mind. Just us. There is no them. You as parents and families, as a congregation, sent us as a form of an emissary to represent you in D.C. To see, to learn, to serve, and come back and report. So you let us, you even let us take the new bus. We appreciate that. You prayed for us and you missed us. This is what we know. We are different in where we live, and we have or what we don't have, but the same. We all, we all need to be accepted we all want to be happy. 
We need food. We need to be warm, feel, and to be safe. We need kindness from others. And we need when we screw up. So if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your If you've come because liberation is bound up with mine, then work together. Let us begin.